welcome to everyone. Um, we are very excited to uh, launch into the first of a five-part webinar series, uh, Bridges to Employment, and it is an extremely exciting uh, part of our new training program, which we will I'll actually talk about at the end. Um, so today we are going to welcome both Brenda Mosby and Donna Sablon, and um, I'll let we'll do a little bit of introductions. Um, in case you don't know, I'm Angela Nevin. I'm the director of training for uh, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I'm the one who pesters you with updates and emails. So I'm always the one you can get back to if you need. A um, couple things, just some housekeeping. Please leave your video off. Um, that way we can maximize our bandwidth because we do expect a full, uh, a full group today. We are going to try to take questions as we go along. So please put them in the chat. Um, and we will have a couple uh, little short stops where we'll answer some of those questions. If you, um, or I'm sorry, afterwards you will all receive a Q&A sheet that has a whole bunch of answers, questions and answers that we pulled together about buy-in. Um, we are recording the presentation, so please be aware of that. There are, um, there is closed captioning available. You just have to turn it on. It is an auto caption. And this is, we just wanna make sure that you understand this is an overview presentation. Next month, we will be doing a walkthrough and filling out applications. So if you, uh, you have questions about how it's done, that's gonna be answered next time. If you attend this session and part, this part two, you will uh, be eligible for a certificate of attendance if you need that for your job. And with that, I'm going to give it over to Brenda Mosby. Thank you, Angela. And again, good morning to everyone. This is so exciting um, that you're all here. Uh, my name is Brenda Mosby, and I am the owner and operator of Mosby Services. It is an employment service for people with disabilities. I have been doing this for over 20 years, and I love it, and it's exciting. I am also a member of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I was a, I started off as a member, and right, and now I'm currently the co-chair of the um, board for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, I just want to say that employment is, is vital and important. And we know that it is going to take these bridges to help people to um, get the employment that they want and that they deserve. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dawn. Howard. Hi, I'm Dawn Howard. I'm the Director of Community Organizing and I get the privilege of introducing Donna Sablon who started out over 20 years ago as a member volunteer of CCDC um, and um, became a board member. And now she is the CCDC Director of Medicaid Appeals and Eligibility. And she has a wealth of information to share with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's kind of jump in because time will go fast. So today we're going to give you an overview of buy-in. There are a lot of details. You'll have questions. You can put them in the chat. And um, next time, as if you attend when we go through the app, some other stuff will make more sense and answer some of your question. So what is Medicaid buy-in? It's an option for qualifying adults with disabilities to buy into Colorado Medicaid. We're one of the only states I am aware of currently who does buy in the way we do with the um, most liberal and realistic ability to get on it and use Medicaid in the way most people need it. 
it's for those who work and earn too much money to qualify for Medicaid or long-term care. You pay a monthly premium based on your income with certain rules. There are no assets and you must have a qualifying disability. Angela. Can Sorry, Donna. Oh, no <laughs> worries. <laughs> I was reading a question. If you want to go through this part, I'm going to let you. Okay. If you're all right with that. There we go. So Biden was an idea put forward in the 1990s. People needing Medicaid couldn't work because income and asset limits. <laughs> And that's been that way for so many years where people with disabilities have had to stay at the lowest rung of the poverty level in order to get what we need. Then there was an actual study. Sorry. Done. No worries. <laughs> Sorry, Donna. Somebody told me that they were seeing my other, my second screen. So hang on a second. Oh, my apologies. No worries. Hold on. There we go. Let's try this. Okay. Now, do you just see the presentation? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Back to you. So there was the actual study, which basically says whether something's cost-effective, affordable, or not. Well, of course, they found it was, and, and it makes sense the way you determine affordability, it wouldn't be. But then a wonderful thing happened after the ACA passed. The state implemented the hospital provider fees as a funding source for Medicaid expansion. About 10 years ago, they, we gained legislation. When I say we, Josh Winkler, was one of the leads in changing some of the expansion, but we means people who needed Medicaid, people who want Medicaid, orgs that worked with CCDC. Most of the time it's a bunch of people. So about 10 years ago, we gained legislation that authorization to add child and adult buying into Medicaid expansion. It excluded long-term care, which made no sense in Josh's mind, like many others. Why? Because without the long-term care being included, we still had to remain poor in order to get what we needed to live a functional life and be able to work. Josh is such a cool, unique guy and very stubborn, but amazing with policy work. He started first as a CCDC member, and then he became uh, the uh, chair for okay. CCDC board. And now he works at the Lieutenant Governor's Disability Policy Guy. He's amazing. And he got this changed in 2014. So much of this stuff is new and ever-changing because somebody really puts themselves out there and hounds and learns the rules and gets things changed for all of us if we work together. Um, I can't, um, and most pro there were, most of the problems have been fixed, but there are always things we can improve on. One of the things we improved on was we did get a law and we'll, um, discussed it a little further down, where people who are already on buy-in who turn age 65 will no longer have to get kicked off. But we're going to talk about current. So who qualifies? 
Currently, you must be 16 to 64 years old. You must be employed. You must have a qualifying disability. You have two ways to do that. You can be on SSI or SSDI, which the federal government, Social Security, has already found you disabled. If not, then you do state disability determination. And that's using Social Security criteria to determine you eligible only to have the ability for some Medicaid access programs. You do not get cash like you were. You would if Social Security found you disabled and you worked or didn't work. Your income after disregards, now truthfully, unless you're on kids buy-in, a child buy-in program, um, there are no disregards, but it does apply to children. And for example, you can earn $9,655 uh, a month to and still qualify. It's calculating your income. Now, there are two ways to calculate income that um, we'll go over a little further um, down in the slide so we can compare it to the chart that we have of your premium. Angela, can you please? Thank you. So there we go. So income is calculated two ways. We talked about on the previous slide how your disability is determined. So if you have unearned income, income from a settlement that you get a monthly payment, income from Social Security, income from retirement, um, a private disability insurance, that money, when you calculate your income counts, dollar for dollar. There is no reduction except $20. So you take your unearned income, you subtract $20, put that in one piece. Now you must be working in the working category you take your income, you subtract $65, and you cut your income in half. When you combine both of those two income sources, that most people have to, in my experience, um, you then look at the chart real simple. That's what you're going to pay for your premium. If you do not pay your premium, you will be kicked off Medicaid buy-in. It's an obligation, just like if you had Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Anthem, whatever else. You must pay your premium. It says it, you pay it. The state does have a couple options to pay it. We will go through that next time. Again, roughly figure your... Unearned income dollar for dollar, earned income half. Don't worry about the 20 and 65 on a quick calculation. Just get an idea what you're going to pay. Um, next slide, please. We have a couple questions here real sure. quick. I think it'd be a good time to, to answer some. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the first ones is if I'm self-employed from uh, Jennifer, an independent contractor, will I still be eligible for the program? As long as your income is not um, over the threshold, absolutely. We have a bunch of people who have their own businesses. 
truthfully, the only business so far I have seen to be a challenge is real estate. Oh. Because you get, you may not get something for so many months, then you sell a home and you may get 35000 in one month and then not sell a home and get 20000 And even when you income average those high numbers to uh, break it down, it's still a challenge. I have rarely found um, an easy way working with the state to um, have real estate come out positive. It's the, just the way the business runs. Donis, uh, Lori asks, how do you go about getting on the disability determination? Before you answer that, I'm going to roll another question in there because okay. it comes back to um, from Tom. I don't understand how you must be employed but also must be disabled under SSI, SSDI. So those are both kind of the same question about the disability determination. Okay, so to get state disability determination, it's on the Medicaid healthcare policy and financing website. We're gonna actually go over that stuff next time, walk people through. Tom, for your question, um, there is a misunderstanding that even when you are on Social Security disability, you can't work. They have a ton of programs, and that's more Brenda's area. Brenda, do you want to um, take over and answer that for a moment, please? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just take a few seconds. That's why we're having bridges to employment, because we really want people to understand that if you're on SSI and SSDI, um, there you can you can work, and, and the buy-in is one of those um, um, bridges that help you um, to employment. Um, I'm going to be doing a series in um, May. Mine's a schedule for May, so I can talk uh, more about that, about the different um, ways and methods. And Social Security has in place um, options for people to work, and some may even be able to keep their benefits or cash benefits, um, and some may work and reduce their benefits, and then many will work and come off of their benefits, but there's a lot of things in place to allow a person to do that. Um, okay, real quick here. Uh, da, da, da. Once you turn 64, are you dropped or can you stay on till you're uh, on till you are 65 or 66? So the law changed last, um, last year in 2020 until July 1st, 2022. If you turn 65 right, right now, you will be ineligible to continue Medicaid buying. If you turn 65 on or after July 1st, 2022, you will be able to stay on buy-in. Rules change. This is what we have now. Things can be changed, but um, they, that's where we are. Getting this expansion to go over 65 took a long process, a lot of people working together. And um, we had COVID and that did budgetary structure problems and we got something. And sometimes we just have to get something and build on that again. Excuse me, Donna, can I ask yes. a quick question? Because I um, that was that other question that came up. There's a difference. There's social security disability that you can be qualified for, but, but the state can determine you disabled um, and you can do the buy-in program, right? 
Right. That's okay. what state disability determination does. Okay. You don't have to be on Social Security. No, oh. if you are, you just don't have to do the extra step of disability determination because you're determined. Thank you. So we had another question about the mathematical equations and yes. um, I'm just gonna say there, there are places that you, there are ways to, or resources that can help you figure it out. Um, but I think what Donna, what you said about any of your work income, your earned income, just divide it in half. Right. And that's roughly, that's a, a, a decent rough calculation, would you say? Right, because you're only subtracting $65 off of all your work income. So just calculate it roughly. Work income added all together, divided by two. It gives you a rough, a good solid rough estimate. So if I, for example, if I made $3,000 a month, basically my my monthly payment would fall in the second or the third, which would be third, about $90. Because half of $3,000 would be $1,500. That's why I picked that number. It's easy to divide. Right. And then <laughs> once the system, you subtract the $65, you are in there. You're in that $90 range. Got it. Donna, could you also explain too, because you shared with me that the minimum that you can make, I mean, you could make, you could be dog sitting and and right. earn money. Okay. And and go all the way so that people understand that, you know, um, you may be doing something already that you're getting paid for, um, babysitting, dog sitting, those kinds of things. Right. So technically Medicaid buy-in has no a minimum amount of employment criteria for it's good to do two hours a month at minimum wage it gives you some consistency one hour a month technically works but um you you're still doing a job you could walk a dog. You could babysit for your grandkids. You could help your neighbor fold their clothes. You could take um, your neighbor's trash out, your landlord's trash, your parents' trash if they own the house. Anything you are working with consistency, you can be paid for. You have to, and we'll go into that. Um, further down again, as a reminder, you have to prove you are paid. It is a month to month program. So month to month, you need to prove you were paid or rare exception, COVID, were people with disabilities. So we are going to get sick or you have COVID. Um, Things like that, you have to maintain attachment to your employer. And that takes a simple letter from your employer saying, you are unable to work because of this, but you are still employed with them. That includes the dog walking or um, taking the trash out. Let's say we see it a lot, right? We live where there's snow. We have a big snowstorm. The waste management company goes, hey, we're not going to pick up trails this week. It's unsafe, put out next week. Who you're working for to do that task would just make a little note that we had a snowstorm. You are still working for them, but you couldn't do your job, so you won't be paid for that week. It is a very flexible program. All right, let's, should we continue on to benefits? What, yes, what you can expect to get out of this? All right, there we go. So basically everything goes into buckets or like a spider web, you have little webs that come off. So your physical health benefits is one tier. 
there's no right or wrong way for you to choose to use your benefits in the order you personally need them. You get a health care visit. They can be in person now. They can also be remotely. Um, you get pharmacy, getting your meds. Again, during this time, COVID time, we do um, have more starting up. You can go to your pharmacy and pick it up. It can be mailed to you. Durable medical equipment, wheelchairs, Oops, CPAP. Oh. I'm going to try to catch up with you here. Let's oh. use the slides. I'm sorry. Let's go this way, that way, because you started going into more of what was in there. So does that work? Oh, yeah. My brain just works that it's way. Okay. <laughs> We're being so, flexible. <laughs> so you have the, you get specialty visits. You also get um, home health. Now, vision depends. If you are a minor under 21, so you would be a Medicaid buy-in for children, or you need cataract service, you will have vision care. If not, you will not have vision care. However, you get dental. So dental does cleaning, fillings, root canals, crowns, partial dentures, some other things. They're not going to do implants and they're not going to do non-medically, dentally necessary. When, what I hear many clients say or people just asking about buying, they go, but it's going to cost me money. Okay, let's talk realistically here. Um, if you're on Medicare, disabled, you are paying $144 a month for your Medicare. You are not getting dental. So, or if you have an employer insurance, are you going to get everything that you are paying your towards your employer insurance you're getting from Medicaid. That is what you have to realistically decide. What do you need? And what is the actual cost? In 99% of the cases, Medicaid gives you a full valued picture for less money on the whole we're only talking people with disabilities with our increased needs. So when you see a premium, don't panic. Break it down. What's your deductible? What's your co-pays? What do you need? And some of the things you need could need hospitalization, expensive, emergency services, Transportation. Now there's two kinds of transportation. Medical and non-medical transportation. So medical transportation is for an actual medical appointment of some kind. Includes dental too. Non-medical, if you are on certain waivers, you can use those to go to the grocery store. You can use those for um, other necessity things, but it's not medical appointments. Again, because you choose to buy into Medicaid, you have those options. Um, Maternity and newborn care. Yes, people who have disabilities have children, naturally. So that is a benefit. Many people use them. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, maternity is a lot of in-home stuff. You also have mental health care. Mental health care can be for alcohol and drug services, behavioral health counseling, 
inpatient, outpatient, um, biological based. You know something that people use it for that is not thought of all the time? Let's say your disability is caused by life happened. You get into an accident, you got COVID, um, you had a stroke. You have no idea about how to move forward living with a disability. There are mental health programs that help you learn and your family and your friends and your support how to learn to move forward, how to learn to live with the disability. So mental health is mental health of all kinds and varieties. Please do not assume that this is the entire list of things you can get mental or physical help for. Um, now, durable medical equipment and therapies truthfully gets a little tricky. Usually, um, regular pharmacy medications are easy. Pre prior authorizations go in. No biggie. They're approved or they're denied. Easy to, easier to deal with. Durable medical Equipment can be tricky if you need wheelchairs, if you need insulin pumps. There are some things that just are tricky. It does not mean when you get a denial, you can't do anything about it. Why we are human beings. We all have different needs. Our bodies are different. Um, laboratory x-rays, things like that, piece of cake. Now, OTPT, occupational physical therapy or speech, is tricky. Medicaid gives you generally 12 appointments a year, except if you have two insurances. Some people keep their work insurance, they're on their parents, their spouse insurance, and some people have Medicare. Depending on the type of coinsurance you have, you can get more than the 12 visits a year. That's kind of the, in my opinion, the only really restrictive um, part of Medicaid besides the dental where you can't get implants and a couple of things. Um, okay. So, Basic benefits, way cool. Same as you would get with any other um, insurance from your employer, the exchange, buy it outright. You're going to get well care. You're going to get chronic disease management, vaccines, um, immunization, screenings for cancer and other diagnoses. Um, Alzheimer's, whole bunch of stuff. OBGYN, hearing um, services, hearing aids, again, depends on age and, and depends on certain criteria. If you're an adult being over 21, allergy testing and shots, um, family planning, it's good for anyone. And... Uh, <laughs> contraceptives and emergency situations. They are benefits. I'm not going to go into it. That's more going down your own personal preferences. You do what's right for you in that area. Donna, we have a few more questions. Can we sure. take a, a short, I'm trying to watch the clock here. Yep. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. If, med if someone's Medicaid eligibility run ends in October, when will they want to file for buy-in? You can do it at any point. If there isn't an open enrollment like there is with regular? Nope. 
Medicaid buy-in, you want to do it uh, tomorrow. If you want to do it next year, buy-in is an optional program. The thing I personally, again, doing this every day and being on buy-in myself, I do not suggest you wait to the last second, especially if you are not on SSI or SSDI. Let me be very clear about this. It will be 90 days to run disability determination if you are not on SSI or SSDI. You do get backdated benefits, but we're going into the perfect topic, long-term care services and waivers. They cannot back away backdate waiver services. So if you are, uh, if you need long-term care, do not wait to the last second because you cannot backdate services. If you paid somebody, you will not be reimbursed. That is the only caveat. It's rare people do that, but don't, don't wait. Sooner. It, Sooner rather than later, in other words. Especially if you need long-term care. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, does being a full-time student count as employment? No. That was just pretty much straightforward. I have a question. I do photography for a nonprofit. My time is donated. Last year, I only made $125. Is there anything about donated time? Nope. You have to have that income and proof. But that $125, um, okay, if you made that $125, but you were still attached, like if the, non, the place you're donating your time to pays you to take a picture every month, it has to be actual provable paid work. I, I remember some, in, oh, sorry, Donna, go ahead. Some schools have work. Um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of it, but they have work programs in school. Quite a few before COVID, if you told them you needed to get a Medicaid buy-in, they could hire you to do something around the school while you were a student. It's about being creative. When I was doing the, the question and answer sheet, I did, I came, you know, it's their very specific volunteer work does not count. Right. Um, we had a question that might have been answered in the chat, but is dental limited to $1,000 a year for benefits? It uh, is because of COVID and when. A, a huge group of us, Medicaid clients, organizations with the budgetary restraints because of COVID, in order to not have to cut it, it was agreed upon again with tons of people that it would be reduced, I believe, for possibly up to two years against the con its economy based reduced to a thousand dollars a year tom says beginning in april it sounds like um medicaid med i'd have to check i've heard two dates understand medicaid dental runs july 1st to june 30th so april would typically not be a cutoff date. Hmm. All right, those are all the questions we have right now. Okay. We've got 20 minutes just to give you a heads up. Okay, I'm glad you're watching the clock. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, so long-term services and supports. One of them, one of the waivers is called Home and Community-Based Services. HCBS waiver. Now, the only way, only program 
when we're talking about these is we cannot talk about the developmental disabilities waiver. It is not available under the buy-in program. They're structured different. There's a whole different criteria, different rules. So again, maybe in time as people um, fight for it and people who aren't getting it work together with people who are getting Medicaid buy-in and organizations, things can change. Right now, that is not available. Um, so basically, home and community-based services, HEBS, it allows individuals who are at risk of being placed in the institution to remain in their community. Now, why would we make everybody uncomfortable by using the word institution when we fight not to keep you in? It's because it's a criteria. There are some programs and, they, and access to certain things where you have to use particular words as uncomfortable as they are. That does not mean you have to go into an institutional placement to come back out, no. It just means you meet a criteria to get these extra sets of benefits that you may qualify if you meet the criteria. The, these waivers are available under the buy-in program. You have brain injury waiver, community mental health supports and services. Oh, sorry. He, he, he went too fast. Sorry. <laughs> the elderly, blind, and disabled, spinal cord, and supported living waiver. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Wait. Oh. It's okay. got to be Monday. <laughs> it, definitely. So brain injury waiver is one, just one name. Your waiver, as you work through the process, should be paired off with your diagnosis and your needs. As we go through these, and I know we don't have a lot of time um, left, but each waiver has things that you need or don't need, whatever waiver you meet the criteria for, if you have two, you meet for, there's no right or wrong answer. It's based on what you need. Who qualifies for brain injury? Uh, you must also be willing to get services in your home or community. Um, you... Um, must need long-term care services as you would get in a nursing home or hospital. You must be 16 or older. You must have a brain injury. Your brain injury occurred before your 65th birthday. And again, your diagnosis must fit in certain categories. It says contact your local single entry point to find out more. Okay, um, yes, but don't contact them before you're on Medicaid <laughs> because they can't do nothing for you. <laughs> Everything has a <coughs> path and structure that's easy to go through. Um, community mental health waiver Again, the same criteria basically on the left you have to meet. And then you can also receive in-home services. You must require long-term supports and services. That's the same. Those basically are the same, but with, no, please go to the, there Sorry. you go. Thank you. Sorry, um, I twitched. <laughs> no worries. A person experiencing 
severe and persistent mental health needs that require assistance with one or more daily activities. Again, you may be a person, depending on your situation, where um, you could be eligible for a mental health waiver, but because you were in that car accident or you uh, had a mountain climbing accident or ski accident, you might also need to consider spinal cord waiver. This waiver is restricted. You must be 18 years of age or older. Um, you must have had um, a DSM-5 within the past year, um, episodic reoccurrence. So again, it's one type of waiver. Angela, can you move to that next one, please? Got it. Thank you, ma'am. Now, <laughs> EBD, again, cat, same basic criteria is you must be 18 to 64. Um, now, EBD is a general hub. Truthfully, most people are in that category. It just is, is the general category it meets a lot of criteria and you you can get a lot out of it without having to need um, specific brain injury or mental health or um, spinal cord or SLS. So it's just a general category. Um, same thing, you must meet long-term care um, you must be 18 or older um, or 18 to 65, uh, be blind, have a physical disability or a diagnosis of HIV or age. If you are 65 and older, you must have be determined to have a significant functional impairment. Where does that start? That goes back to um, having to go through state disability determination and looking at the um, criteria which may have changed. You may have been working on buy-in and then you come off buy-in because you're 65. You were never on social security or if you were, and you go to retirement, you are no longer disabled. Yeah, I know. It, <laughs> some things make no sense. So you have to go through state disability determination anyway, make sure you meet the functional and financial requirements because you're going to move to another category. Um, next, please. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. spinal cord waiver is restricted. It's restricted to one of the following Denver metro counties, Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, and Jeffco. You have to be 18 years of age or older, have a spinal cord injury diagnosis, have a significant function impairment. In 2020, there will be an independent evaluation presented to the state that measures the outcomes um, of the quality of life and cost expenditures for Watch the out. waiver participants receiving. Because in this waiver, it's the only one you're going to get acupuncture, massage, chiropractic. So let them do a cost evaluation, see if it saved money. Why is that good? If we find it in one area in the future when we're economically stable as the state, 
there's nothing saying we can't potentially work towards getting it into another waiver. Um, so would you say this was more, this is more of a test? Um, it was of more of a pilot. Yep. That's what I meant, a pilot. Okay. All right. And one then more, one more slide and then some questions. Okay. So HCB has supported living waiver services. Same options. Um, criteria. You had to be have a developmental disability, but in this one, up to three people, persons receiving services can live together. That's all math. We're not going to go into that right now. Participants in the waiver do not require 24 hour supervision on a continual basis. That's really important. Super, super important. Individuals must meet intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disabilities as defined in statute, which we're giving you there. Um, individuals for developmental disabilities on only again, SLS waiver, not IDD waiver, SLS, have to go through their community center board. That is where they run through. Although I am saying that part of Medicaid buy-in still goes through other parts of the state system and county, but the community center board must be involved. So again, you're adding people. Sometimes adding people who know these things goes really well. Sometimes adding more people who don't know them causes problems. Don't give up. Everybody, every one of us had to learn things in life. Just like a lot of the people who have the authority to make decisions or are supposed to be guiding us. Don't give up. It's something we have to deal with. <clears throat> Donna, <clears throat> since we're wind we are winding down, um, you had shared with us before that with the uniqueness of this program, because everybody's unique. Everybody's unique when they go into Social Security. They'll be unique when they go in there. And that you're available for questions outside of this seminar? Yes, we, uh, CCDC has two, preferably if you have access to the internet and it seems like most people do, or you might have a friend who does, we have a help sheet form. That is the easiest way to put your request for help in. If you do not have access at all, it's and you need to call our main line and Angela um, can give it, uh, pop it in there. It's probably on your paperwork. We do not answer that as fast, not because we don't want to, because like, it's me, one person, and and I can play phone tag with people or I can answer an email. So if you do call and don't use our help sheet, understand it might be three or four days before um, I'll call or Kristen will call and um, we can get back to you. Um, since and I and I just wanted to throw some things out that I think are important for people to know, um, the bridges to to employment. We know there's there's usually two things that keep people from looking for employment, and that's their health care, and that's losing their benefits. And I want to um, really put a, a a plug in for our March. Um, uh, presentation, our webinar on March, we will have someone who is what's called a community uh, work incentive coordinator. They used to be called benefit planners. And the reason I want to bring that up and encourage you to attend that is because 
they you will learn things like if you're an SSI, you can make $85 or less and it and your SSI not be affected. If you're an SSDI, they have an amount. Um, I, I think right now is over $1,100 a month that you can earn without um, having your cash benefits affected, but you need more details. And that month there, you're going to talk about it. It could really fits with what you're hearing here um, because um, you might just want to make $20 a month and, and, to, and understanding how your cash benefits are not affected and understanding how they are affected. If you want to earn more, um, please um, tune in for the webinar on in March. And Brenda, on your March webinar, you would cover um, Erwes. Erwes, yeah, those, and we'll also cover the sixteen nineteen B, which perfect. is similar. Yes, which is similar to the buy-in program, but it is through Social Security. And then the the work-related expenses, we we call them Erwes. Um, that they'll talk about that because you can take. Um, um, you can deduct that from the money that you're earning so that you keep, you stay below that, that threshold that they have. Um, I just really want to put that plug in for those of you that decide that because you want more information about what Donna's talking about, um, then I would say um, definitely um, come to our webinar next month. And the other thing, and Angela is going to follow up with this. Um, we really encourage you to join the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, Coalition. They celebrated 30 years and this is what they do. They make sure the legislation works for us and they make sure we create webinars like this so that we are becoming educated. We need to understand knowledge is power and what we don't know can hurt us. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Donna and Angela. We have just about three minutes and a few questions that we could hit real quick. And remember, anything we don't answer will come out in that, um, that question and answer that we'll be sending out to you. I've had a number of people ask uh, about the slides. Yes, you'll get a PDF version of the slides so that you'll have that as well. Um, does child support count as income? Unearned income, yes. All right. And that's more of a one to one, one, to one dollar count, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, Calculations. with situations like that, um, those we have to run through totally separate. There are some exceptions depending if the child has disability, the adult. So those we take offline and evaluate one-to-one. Uh, -one. Got it. Um, if a parent is applying for buy-in, is a child eligible for buy-in too, or should uh, CHIP Plus be applied for instead? Once the parent, again, you're, so buy-in is a single person program. They evaluate each person individually. Your child would then be applied for, for either CHP plus or Medicaid on, on that. The, it can go both ways. Again, it's income-based. Does the child have disability? There are multiple ways to run that as well. You just touched on one of the other questions, which was my husband makes most of the money do you claim what they make uh, or is it just my income? It's just your income. Yeah, which is significantly lower. So we got that one. Um, if someone's on the DD waiver, but they want went to buy-in, could they switch to the SLS waiver? They'd have to ask the single entry point, the, the uh, CCB. I, there is always a risk in the DD system of losing something you did not realize was going to have an impact and you can't go back and get it. So you wanna really do some research before you right. make a choice. DD always do that extra res um, 
yeah, investigation, asking questions. The Yorks are really good with that. They're a nonprofit and um, they're kind of like us. It's about you. We're not selling you nothing. <laughs> they're not going to sell you anything. We actually are at time. Um, do you want to... Uh, we will send out all these questions, just so I said. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. Donna and Brenda, thank you so much. Don as well. Brenda, did you have any last words? Um, that no, except ominous. that except that we look forward to seeing you at our next um, at a, over the five months with the um, the webinars. And again, um, it's really important that you a better understand about your benefits and that will be in March. Perfect. How they're Thank affected you very much. Thank you Thank everyone you. for Thanks. attending. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>